Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is John Nine. I'm one of the senior programmers here at the festival. I want to welcome you to Cinema Cafe, where uh, our motto is that strange things are afoot, which is our way of saying that we have no idea what is going to happen here. Um, I'm excited that um, we have a pretty amazing program this year in the Cinema Cafe lineup. Uh, it's uh, tomorrow you'll see Werner Herzog and Joshua Oppenheimer if you come by. We have Rebecca Hall and uh, Michael Shannon on Tuesday. Uh, Charlie Kaufman later in the week, DA Pennebaker and Chris Hedges. So we're very excited um, for the lineup. Please check it out. There's some great panels in this space as well. Um, but I want to thank uh, our guests, especially for coming today. Um, John Krasinski has been at Sundance several times. He's here this year with a film that he directed called The Hollers. Uh, he was here in 2009 with a film that he directed called Brief Interviews with Hideous Men. Thomas Middleditch also here with the film, uh, Jeff Bain's film Joshi, which premieres tonight. Uh, he was here last year with a film called The Bronze, which actually opens in March. You should check that out. And Logan Hill, uh, who describes himself as a self as a movie crazed uh, contributor to New York Times. This is accurate. Uh, as a real film lover and a really fantastic, sharp moderator, so I want to thank him for coming. And I, wa I want to thank uh, the New York Times for this uh, Times Talk uh, collaboration that we do. Really grateful um, for everything they do, and, and uh, we're happy to uh, collaborate with them in getting these things out into the world. So thanks, everyone, for coming. I want to welcome from uh, the New York Times the director of programming of Times Talks, Carol Day. Thank you, John. Thanks, everybody, for coming. The New York Times and Times Talks are just so pleased and honored to be here at the festival again this year. And we salute them for bringing everyone from around the world to share their craft and their creativity and to inspire us all with their stories. And it's so great to have our panelists and our moderator here today. I know we are in for a great conversation. So let's hear from them. I, please join me in welcoming Logan Hill from the New York Times, Thomas Middleditch, and John Krasinski. Thank you for coming. Logan, when you got to the New York Times, what kind of pranks did you do on each other? Uh, mostly like trying to uh, squeeze curse words into, the, into your articles. It was really hard. They Hilarious. catch them all. Yeah. You guys are adorable. Thank you guys yeah. so much for coming. All right. Thank you. The rest of our Q&A will just be more of the fashion shoot with Thomas Middleditch oh, yeah. that was happening before the talk. You guys are busy. you got a lot going on. Um, uh, and I thought we would start by talking about the big day you had yesterday, Manchester by the Sea, by a Sundance favorite, Kenneth Lonergan, whose You Can Count On Me is one of my favorite films ever screened here, uh, took an idea from you and made a film called Manchester by the Sea, which premiered yesterday to the best reviews of the festival so far, probably. I would love to make my whole career out of that. Just like, hey, I have an idea, and someone's like, I'll make a really good film out of it. <laughs> sure, that sounds perfect. Um, I'm just so honored to be a part of that in any way, shape, or form. Kenny, like you said, I'm a huge fan of his. And You Can Count On Me is still one of my favorite movies ever. So um, just being at the party last night in his sphere was pretty awesome, just to be around that guy. I would love to, I mean, I don't actually know the exact story of how you two connected and how this, this came together. Where did the idea come from? It was actually my first script idea. Um, I wrote a script with Matt Damon called Promised Land. And before Promised Land, we were thinking of doing uh, a story about um, uh, a brother who comes to visit his, his other brother and realizes that his brother's sick and has to take care of his son. And so that was sort of this idea that we came up with. And I, and, or I came up with and I brought it to Matt. And Matt was like, I know who's perfect for this, Kenny Lonergan. <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's kind of perfect for it. And then um, he went into whatever amazing writing hole he has and came out with a movie that was really well <laughs> reviewed yesterday. So and what, and that's a new kind of direction for you, producing more, uh, taking more of a creative role behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, how's that feeling? Is it comfortable? It is so much fun. I did not expect it to be this much fun. I mean, I think this is, you know, it's, I think it's the reason why everybody's here. It's like this is a new world of, of creating your own stuff and getting your own stuff out there, and you can do it in so many different ways. So that's, that's really exciting to me. I think it's, it's, a, it's a new world of, you know, you have an idea, you, you think up something either silly or serious or whatever, and you, you just put it with the right people and get it out there and let people be the judge on their own, you know, rather than all these ideas in the past. You can't get financing for it or you can't get the right people to get together, and now I think there's a lot more power in the creative. So I think it's... 
it's a very exciting time. You may have seen uh, their television shows. These guys have been on, on a few TV shows in the past. And I, I think 10 years ago, your careers might have been really different. You know, if you were starting out, if you were 10 years older than you are now, or 20 years older than you are right now, uh, there just weren't actors that were moving between film and TV in the same way. And, I, I've, and I've interviewed people before, and they've said, well, you know, it's like a school cafeteria. Like The cool kids would sit at the film table, and as soon as you moved to the other table, the cool kids wouldn't like you anymore, and you couldn't go back to the film table. Um, whereas you guys have moved back and forth pretty easily. Um, how does it feel, sort of, how does that work these days in terms of building a career where you can do both? Or do you not even think about uh, it? You're the genius. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question in which I don't feel comfortable commenting on. Uh, I feel like it's just, uh, that's just the way it is. I mean, there's just more, right at this point, there's just a ton of TV content and a ton of really good TV content. And you, I think, it's a mix of like, there's not as many film roles as there were, therefore it's okay to do this really good TV content. Uh, I also think because it's good, people are like, yeah, we want so-and-so, big famous actor, to be in this in this thing. I mean, now people are doing, uh, people used to turn their nose at like commercial work, and we'll, we've both, everyone who can, uh, will do commercials now, because it just, uh, you know, means we get to buy a new Chevy Volt. <laughs> Chevy. The car of the future. I want to time how long it takes Chevy to call you <laughs> and give you a Chevy Volt Thank for you that. So much. Hey, look, I'm in, the, I'm in the market for a new 2016 model. Love the Volt. I love the battery. I love the gas backup. Chevy. Uh, but you know what I'm saying? I feel like all those lines are blurring, including the internet stuff. I mean, look, like now Netflix and Amazon are major players, not only in TV, but film. Uh, and I think X amount of years ago, they'd be like, they're just the internet. I mean, well, X amount of years ago, you'd just be like, Amazon, that's where I buy my dog food. What are you talking about? Uh, so yeah, <laughs> times are a-changing. Yeah. Amazon's where I bought my dog, actually. <laughs> it's, weird. it's weird. Yeah. Um, From puppymills.com. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They're such good people. <laughs> They're super nice. Um, I sent mine back, and I just got a new one. <laughs> so cool. Buy one, get one. Um, <laughs> I think also um, the cool thing about content being all over the place and all the different avenues is that you're, you really are back to a world of being based on your merit, I think. And I think that's really exciting. I think that because there's so much out there, there's a lot of people who are scared about how much content's out there. But I think that because there's so much content out there, users actually get to choose what they want. And so people, consumers can take whatever show they want and talk about whatever their show they want. And so when you succeed, especially like his show's succeeding, it's because everybody likes the show. That's awesome. Rather than we put a whole ton of money you know, uh, marketing it, it is terrible. But as long as people watch it, that's all we care about. Like <laughs> yeah. those, hopefully those days are diminishing. Yeah. Yeah, there, and there's like two sides to that. Coin. I don't think your show's terrible. That's fine. It's not. It's not for everyone. Uh, I mean, it's for like not for dummies. Like only smart people. Uh, but I think there's two sides to that, right? Like really great shows or content gets lost uh, or or not viewed enough, whatever that might be. Uh, you also miss that thing. Uh, where you watch, and this is uh, this is like total regurgitation of that's been said a million times. Where you all watch the same thing, and then you all get the water cooler discussion about it, like X whatever in the late '90s or whatever. We'd all everybody would watch Seinfeld and know those episodes. Uh, now it's just it's just different, I guess. Same goes with like with news and stuff. You only get your news, you only get the content you like, and your view never changes. God, we're all we're all in it now, aren't we? <laughs> Well, I feel like at the end of the year, it used to be people would say, oh, you got to check out this movie, that movie, and you'd be like, okay, that's like four, six hours i got to catch up on. And now it's like you need to see all these seven TV shows, all 13 hours of each of one. Yeah, yeah. Do you have trouble keeping up with what all your Yeah, we have, what we have to now? do is do away with, like, careers and, like, <laughs> jobs and just stream stuff. we yeah. got to talk about stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. just jobs getting in the way of my homeland. Exactly. And then make sure right after every episode, get on the Internet, say your opinions. <laughs> make sure you mention the people that you're saying your opinions to so they read it. Hashtag at times ha talks. Hashtag. Uh, well, yeah, I don't. I, I only watch a handful of shows, and the main one is The Bachelor because you know it's 
the best show on television. Ben, oh, Vanilla Ben, w would we you, love you. Would you ever want to be The Bachelor? I can't, I can't. I mean, if things fail, uh, yes. <laughs> if things fail, I would love to be the emotionally broken man that courts 30 women at a time on a game show where everyone's trying to convince themselves desperately that they're in love so they can be on the game show longer. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Uh, you know, I, that doesn't sound that different from Joshi. Uh, this heartbroken sounds, man okay. thrown into it. <laughs> Connect these dots. Uh, it's very different. But a heartbroken man who's thrown into a, like a crazy rowdy party. Explain to us what the film's about. Well, uh, terrible transition, but I had to make it at some point. You're doing great, Logan. I, <laughs> when you joined the New York Times, um, <laughs> your your interview was like, "How well can you connect the Bachelor to anything?" Uh, <laughs> you barely passed. Uh, uh, Josh, he is a tragedy besets a, a, a young man, uh, and then he essentially. St I don't. I don't want to give it away. It's about how can I be vague? It's about uh, friends coming together. All right now, your producers are like, "Are you serious? He can't pitch the movie." I want to. I want to. I want to pitch it, but what gives it away or not? I don't know. The first ten seconds are a huge spoiler. It's really hard to get around. And we know it's called Joshy. Okay. It's already out there, man. It's You're done. Right. Okay, so the protagonist is called Josh. Uh, but it's about people coming to, I guess, like a, a strange bachelor party with everybody's own individual baggage, but weren't, but nervous about how everyone's going to be. Great. <sighs> well, we, we got bought just now. <laughs> <laughs> we I love the a, We have a clip which might help. Really? Let's let's check out the clip. Ah. <laughs> uh. Hey, Jody, what? Do you have any words about joining the uh, Greater Tub community? Cool, fun, new, a surprise. Not Tonight, the evening, I love it. Strangers, scared. I'm really happy. Yeah, yeah. with friends. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, let's play your board game in the hot tub. Well, that's obviously impossible. <laughs> hey, Adam, come in here, man. Adam. Yeah, Adam. Adam, come on, buddy. He doesn't Ari. mind. All right. Yeah. My sister's beautiful, and she's a dental hygienist, so she has her own money. That's great. Well, well, why did you say that? <laughs> kind of like... You guys heard that, right? I did you guys... Am I the only one who heard that? I did hear that. It's probably like the fucking... What the fuck dog or whatever. <laughs> there is yeah, a fucking too. murderer in that bush, It's man. not a murderer. It's no, Billy it's Baldwin. Like, it's fucking Laura Dern's <laughs> chocolate lab sneaking hey. around. No, dude, I'm alone. serious, man. I'm, I'm serious. Out. What? I'm out. I'm out. All right, guys. Joshua's weekend. Hey, Ari. Ari. Whoa, we gotta, we gotta, we, we gotta need go to talk with later. Joshua. We need to talk later. Yeah. That is an incredibly confusing clip to say. How did you, uh, how did you get a camera in your after party last night? <laughs> That looked fun. Uh, 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 strange selection, but fun fact about the film: all, uh, all that all that is improvised. Like the script is all beaded out, but all the dialogue and everything that kind of ended up happening is 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 improvised. If that means anything to anyone, <laughs> not to me. It doesn't to me. <laughs> It, it, you're all, you all come off as such good friends in the film, but are these guys that you've been, and, and women that you've been improvising with in L.A. before? The people yeah. you've worked with before? Yeah, m yeah, more or less. I've e at least I improvised with or familiar with their comedy or just known for a while through the comedy scene. Yeah, in both New York and Los Angeles. Um, yeah, and this, this kind of gave everybody a little bit of a chance to... I, I find that it as weird as it is and as funny as it is at times, it's also very real and kind of the weekend ends and that's what it is and that's just the movie. It's kind of like a, just a glimpse, a snapshot, uh, as you saw. I'm doing great at this. <laughs> uh, and we, did, we only had one uh, shirtless clip uh, to run. We didn't have a, a one premiere film. Um, but can you tell us a little bit about the hollers, which made me cry this morning. I just saw it right oh, before I came you. here. thank you. Pussy! <laughs> Redemption. 
<laughs> I don't think I need to talk about my movie now. <laughs> That's gonna go wide. That, that clip's going wide. You might. Um, <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> the Hollers is uh, actually, it's just a movie about family and how complicated it is, um, how special it is, but how hard it is to ride those two rails. I think everybody going home, whether you like your family or you don't like your family, you have to deal with the fact that there is a younger version of you that still sort of haunts that house and you have to come to terms with who that person is and who that, who that person, or who, who your parents think that person is and sort of uh, uh, deal with all this stuff in your past and, and, and back in your hometown. And uh, it was an amazing movie to do. It was actually a movie that I was attached to as an actor first. The incredible writer Jim Strauss wrote the script, who's done many movies here at Sundance. And, um, I think he's one of those rare writers who can take a story that you probably think you've heard before about a guy going back home to his family and write a script that is so well done and so specific that he's able to navigate these hairpin turns between drama and comedy that I think very few people can do. So we were just really lucky to have all the things that you want. You want good material. I won the lottery with my cast. I have Margot Martindale, Richard Jenkins, Anna Kendrick, Charlie Day, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, Charlotte Copley, there are 946 people in my movie. <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, <clears throat> uh, but it was, it, it was truly uh, one of the best experiences of my career, uh, especially being a director with this group of people. Let's talk, I mean, because we've all sort of wanted to recast our own families at various points. That's right? how you pitch a movie, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> I don't even know if that's true. <laughs> people at home are like, ah, that's a decent job, but not great. <laughs> I don't know. Well, let's talk about casting your family. You've got a great three actors that, that make up your family. Casting my real family or? <laughs> casting the family in this film. Yeah, um, I got lucky to have that rare opportunity where everybody you wanted first said yes to the, to the movie. So Marga Martindale plays my mom. It's one of the best performances I've seen ever, but certainly I love seeing someone like Marga Martindale get the chance to play a role that she just knocks straight out of the park. She's so good in everything she does. And I think this part, all due to Jim, was written right for this being sort of the, the flashy role of the movie, and she crushed it. And then Richard Jenkins, I think, is one of the best actors that's ever walked the planet. So having him anywhere near our movie, just even if he did catering, I'd be so excited. <laughs> um, I think I just demoted him. Um, but instead, he came and did... Hey, man, uh, caterers <laughs> are like, screw you, dude. <laughs> we keep you fed. <laughs> But we also love the visitor. Um, that'll, nobody heard that one. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so casting uh, Richard and Margot as my parents, I think really, if I'm honest, put the whole movie in motion. And I think when you have two people like that that give unbelievably sort of titanic performances of, not in the bad way, the good way, um, uh, performances, like I think a lot of. Being rescued on a very Yeah, 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 cool. the rescue people. Yeah, yeah. Um, the heroic part. Um, is uh, it's really easy to get other actors because I think somebody like Anna or Charlotte or Charlie, I think they jump on because you know people like that are just gonna do a good job and you want to be around it. And, and you know, very different films, but they both do sort of strike that balance between some difficult material, really dark stuff, and humor. <laughs> Having trouble asking questions with a straight face. Um, oh, it, when you're in the middle of a scene and you just feel it going wrong, what, what's happening? Yeah, you know, when, you, when you feel like the tone I just go, isn't cut. working. <laughs> Call cut. Uh, like, how, how how can you tell the difference on set when it's working when it's not? I mean, genuinely, you actually you really can feel it. That sounds so cliche, but it's totally true. You can feel it, and I I definitely have had that experience, especially with Margot. There's a couple scenes in the movie where she's so good that I think all the other actors in the room. I looked around as the director, just making sure we had what was happening because it was so good. And then you find yourself like not breathing because you're like, don't screw it up, don't screw it up. Like, if you cough in this take, she'll kill you. Um, so you can definitely feel it. You can feel it in the room, and then you can also feel, you know, not only dramatic stuff, but certainly comedy. Like, when, when, yeah. you, when you're, when you're har having a hard time not getting through the scene, something's working. Um, it won't be in the movie, but it's, it's working. Yeah. I find I've, I've, it's, it's, it's easy to be wrong, too, you know? Like, your little internal director is like, this isn't going well. And then you cut, and you, your director or any type of outside force is like, that was the best take, uh, you know, because I guess maybe part of being uncomfortable or feeling like you second guess it is like part of your character at that moment or whatever, you know, you can be wrong too. 
It's important to just be in the moment. <laughs> well, I've, you know, I was reading an interview with you <laughs> where you were talking about improv uh, sometimes being dangerous than a film or, or a TV set. Yeah. That it, sometimes it could feel bigger or not. Bigger or feel like um, it's a bunch of actors trying to be funny. Like, I, I find, especially if you've got a if good scripted comedic material, or even <laughs> bad, I don't know. Let's say it's good scripted comedic material, and then people are like riffing on top of it. Some things come out of left field, and it just sort of feels like that was something they thought was really funny on the day. They put it in the movie, and now it just feels a bit strange. Uh, feels like uh, people are one-upping each other. But you know there is a, there is a certain type of improv that feels like like it's from the character like it's not like I'm gonna I'm gonna just jam something that sounds weird in here uh, that I think is really great in, in in film and films that are totally improvised like you know let's cite the classics like best of best in show and like waiting for Guffman and stuff like that um, they know how to make it sound real and authentic and a credit to like the directors and Jeff Baina who put our movie together you put those pieces together. Right now you have kind of like, you know what kind of where it goes because you've beaded it out, but all the dialogue in the scene, now you're essentially not only putting puzzle pieces together, you're like making the puzzle piece, then putting it in together. And I think, you know, credit to the, credit to the people who work in post to put improvised movies together. Because, yeah. I mean, your performance is a guy who's really closed off for reasons we won't disclose, but his, yeah. his, but his character is very sort of contained, and 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 are all around you. All these other actors are having a lot more fun, yeah. right? Yeah. Was that difficult on set to kind of keep it so tamped down? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, as someone who's a like a, a kind of a, a ham in in normal life, I in normal life. <laughs> what is that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, people are having fun saying really crazy stuff, and I'm like, I want to say the crazy thing, but no, that's not really what it's like. I mean, that's like Silicon Valley, too. Like, I get TJ saying, like, the weirdest stuff. I'm like, can I say, you know, dick-sucking fuck wit or whatever? <laughs> no, I can't. Uh, I can say that right not here. Not in the no? Times. Okay, cool. <laughs> it's streaming! <laughs> this is a whole other thing. It's all, this is fine here. Oh, God. Uh... <coughs> Uh, but you know, I, I'm I'm happy now because I've had like many many years where I like walk on on stage, for example, as like the talking boner, like crazy guy. <laughs> I'm actually totally fine now with playing someone a little bit more reserved and real. I mean, I, I don't I don't mind playing a straight man. I think that's a it's it's a totally val valuable and uh, often deep role. Hopefully, I'm doing a good job at it. Not now, obviously. And what's it like working with the actor John Krasinski? He's, uh, he's better than I thought he would be. Um, he's got a severe drug habit, which no one knew about. Yeah. yeah. It's crippling. Severe, yeah. The director, John Krasinski, clean as a whistle. Clean as a whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are a good pair. <laughs> the Krasinski brothers. <laughs> I saw him at a bar once. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, to be really honest, I, I feel like <clears throat> people ask me, oh, my God, was it so hard to direct yourself? And I feel like, you know, just hopefully like any other director, and I'm trying to aspire to be as good as you know all the other people that are out there, but um, you just get caught up in your job. And your job is to service these people who have committed themselves to you. And that's such a, a huge honor that I can't even really um, explain. So for me, coming on set every day, it was just, again, it was just don't screw up the scene because these people are doing a really good job. They showed up for you. They're actually paying to be here pretty much and we're in some weird remote location that they had to fly to and take six different planes to get to. So your responsibility level is extremely high and you have six hours to shoot the entire movie <laughs> or so it feels. So really, I didn't even think about the, the idea of it. It was just like, you know, don't, don't screw it up because everybody around you is doing a great job. When you're in that edit room and you're looking at all these different takes of yourself, is it, I mean, it must be difficult to get perspective. How do, how do you figure that out? Do you look to outside sources, your editor, other people to... My performance was the only one I edited in camera. I was like, <laughs> nailed it, got it. Okay, perfect. Um, no, it's, it's, it's weird. Again, I, I do play more of the straight man in the movie. I'm, I'm sort of uh, almost like a narrator character. I don't speak to the audience, but I bring you through the, the story. Um, and so I introduce you to my family and everybody else. And so for me, it was really getting those star performances that everybody else gave and making sure that I could link them with my character. Um, and it's, it is, that is weird to edit yourself and um, hope that you're giving yourself the best performance. Um, 
and then hoping that you're giving everybody else a much better performance, which I, I hope I did. You talk about, again, uh, yeah, those movies you kind of aspire to make. I wonder, at this point in your careers, what kind of work do you aspire to do? Like when you, when you look at your touchstones, what are they these days? And I imagine they might be different than maybe they were 10 years ago. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I mean, you took a deep breath, so you wanted to say something. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, uh, Altitude. I, I have, yeah. <laughs> Heartburn. Uh, well, I still want to do comedy. I always want to do comedy, but um, uh, I, I always think like work that I truly love and I truly get impressed by are, are uh, it's it's usually not <laughs> not not comedy. Like I, I and I always like it when uh, comedians do other stuff. Like I think uh, Adam Sandler did his best work in Punch Drunk Love, and I thought Jim Carrey did his best work in like Eternal Sunshine. Even like John Lovitz and that opening scene of Happiness, when he's like, "You're a horrible person." I mean, it's great. And I would love to go that well, go that way. But uh, at the same time, if they ever make Anchorman Three, I mean, I'm in 100%. <laughs> I'll be a sorcerer in like the next crazy fight. Uh, but yeah, so I suppose, is that accurate? Is that accurate? <laughs> <laughs> that was like me asking my brain if like, was that an accurate thing of what you were, th did this get accurate, the traveling? John? <laughs> what do you want to be? You've done oh, big man. movies, what do you want? <laughs> um, yeah, I feel the same way. I, I mean, I, I always just go for the good story. And, and let's be honest, The Office was 10 years of the best story I could be a part of. And so that was the best. Um, Thank you. Oh, all right. Yeah. Thank you. You guys have seen it? Oh, my God. Um, and, uh, and, and yet, you know, doing a movie like 13 Hours recently is a totally different thing for me, but was also a really important story for me to, you know, once you meet these unbelievable military heroes, all of a sudden that's a whole new story that you want to tell. So for me, it's not drama or comedy. It's just I really want to go with the good story. And always the most interesting stuff feels like something that's, not particularly you. It's like he, you know. It's like he's saying. It's if you offered me a part that was a one-line part in a really cool P.T. Anderson movie or something, I'd do that in a second. But like he said, I mean, I've been writing emails to Will Ferrell for six years about doing Anchorman anything. So <laughs> I'm gonna get that part. Yeah. I'm gonna get it. It's between <laughs> us. That's the thing. Sorcerer number four. I'll do it. <laughs> uh, I, I want to do good stories too. I really think we should take the show on the road. <laughs> <laughs> the Q&A show. Uh, yeah. Um, what'd you learn from Michael Bay as a director? What did I think of Michael Bay? What'd you learn from him as a director? Michael any, Bay. Any Michael Bay tricks you're going to take with you? Yeah, yeah, to be honest, the whole time. I mean, listen, Michael Bay is a singular director. He directs unlike anyone else. And I think he knows it. And I think that that confidence level is a really like wild thing to be around because especially with a movie that was this intense, a story this intense, so highly politicized, you needed someone who knew what he was going to do. And I remember three days before we shot or two days before we shot, we were doing a table read and he said, I've already shot the movie in my head. And I thought he was kidding. So I was like, how was it? And he said, um, <laughs> and he, he didn't smile and he just said, it's really good and it's really emotional. And so then you realize that <laughs> it's true. And you realize that the movie that's on screen is what he had in his head. And so I had never worked with a director like that who was so visually, like, no joke, you'd walk on set. This is a true story. I walked on set one day in just like my regular clothes, hadn't gone through hair and makeup. And he grabbed a camera and put it right up to my face and was like, just look up at that light. And I said, oh, first of all, good morning. Also, this isn't, like, I'm not in makeup. This is, and he was like, just look up. And I said, yeah, but this, is, this isn't even my wardrobe. And he's like, just look up, please, just look up. And you realize that in his computer, he knows that there's one shot in act two, scene four, that he just didn't get the look up to this camera, so he's using this much of your eye. He just knows the whole thing, which is, it's so fascinating. It's, it was so fascinating to watch. And the way he shoots, you know, he, you know, he leapfrogs. He does this leapfrog thing where he'll set up this scene and then he'll be like, all right, guys, we're going to do this. These are the two cameras. I'm going to go over there, blow up a bus. And then these three people have to go over here. And then I'm going to come back. No, I'm going to skip over there. Now back to you guys. Why aren't you ready? And it's, it's pretty crazy. That's how you get a good performance. <laughs> Just scare the crap out of this dude, and he'll do some good stuff for you. I do operate best on fear. <laughs> And you both had the opportunity to work with some people who I imagine were sort of idols or, or people you admired early on in your careers. Who have you learned the most from uh, in recently? So we were talking about Patrick Stewart back set. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Pat, yeah. 
Well, he's a... Uh, yeah, well, I... I'm just having a blast with him. He's not very good at what he does, is the thing. Uh, Peace, too, uh, is a close personal friend of mine. Uh, no, we, uh, we actually met each other doing comedy, honestly. I've been doing a show for 10 years based out of Chicago called The Improvised Shakespeare Company. It's a great show if you're ever in Los Angeles. We're once a month at Largo, um, which is also a great venue. And we've just been doing this, like, you know, kind of like Monty Python meets erudite sort of Shakespeare improv show. And one night we were, we heard that Patrick Stewart wants to like sit in with us. And we're like, yeah, okay, this will be weird. And he was great at it. And he'd never, he'd never studied long form improv, obviously Shakespeare, um, but he was great. It a little blue, a, little, a lot of scenes about like, I'm taking off your penis now. And we're like, okay, uh, <laughs> let's work that into the story. Uh, and uh, now, very strangely, we'll be at, I'll be at like some you know, Hollywood socialite event and I'll see Patrick there and he'll be like, oh, thank God you're here, I know no one. I'm like, I know no one, thank God you're here. <laughs> and now we just like chat and be like, Hollywood is a strange game. <laughs> and he's, he's a perfectly charming man and uh, very fit, God. <laughs> Body of a Greek god. I'll, I'll leave you to dwell on how I know that <laughs> in your own minds. Yeah, I couldn't speak more highly of him. I think he's a great guy. Have, have you had any mentors along the way that have been influential? Oh, yeah, hugely. I mean, I think, um, I don't know, I think it's important to learn from everybody around you, good or bad, you know? So first and foremost with Steve Carell, I mean, I, I, I got to say that uh, watching that guy work for all of you who don't know, I don't know if many people know this, he's one of the more reserved, shy guys, just like the kindest, nicest person who will, <clears throat> who will be like, how was, how was your weekend? Was it good? And I said, yeah. And you know, Emily and I went here for dinner, and he's like, oh, I love that place. That's so great. All right, uh, we're just going to do the scene with Prison Mike. And he's like, yo! And he just like turns it on <laughs> so fast. And like, it's unbelievable. So people are like, wow, what'd you think of him in Foxcatcher? I was like, you should see him on The Office. He goes from like one side to the other so fast and I, he's so unbelievably talented. So, I mean, to work with him as my first real gig was, I mean, it, you, you just start up at the stars and you, you hope that you get to stay up there. And, and it's Mike Judge you've, you've gotten to work a little closely yeah. with and it seems like he was someone you greatly admired early oh, on. Yeah. What's, what have you learned from him? Uh, yeah, that's a broad question. Yeah, what have I learned from him? I learned that I am desperate to impress him at all times. Because uh, <laughs> if you get something that he likes, he'll come from like you know where the where the video village is to like on set and be like, <laughs> that was fantastic. And you're like, oh. <laughs> I've always tried to trick him into doing the voices. Like I'll do my stupid impressions, and then he'll be like, and then he'll do like, oh, uh, you know, like be with a butthead. And it's so weird because your brain doesn't register it. You're like, man, he does a really good impression of like butthead. <laughs> and you're like, no, that's him. That's the voice that you know and love. Um, he's a great arbiter of. I learned from him. It's like he's a great uh, arbiter of comedy and also an incredibly down to earth, like good old boy dude. Like he's had incredible success, uh, wealth, fame, all that kind of stuff. But he is a. He's like. He's a chit chatter and just like a, a normal guy. I like him a lot. He, so, if you get success, be a good boy. <laughs> Your brain is killing it right now. <laughs> it's quite accurate. <laughs> I love thinking of your brain like in Minority Report. Everything you say, it's like good, good. Yeah. Not so great. We'll leave it. Yeah. Except no one knows what you're talking about. Yeah. Clear it. And the guy who's controlling it's like, what is this? Windows 98? He doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't get it very much. So he's like accidentally throwing really good ideas in the recycle bin. <laughs> Computer humor. <laughs> uh, go to your uh, go to your task your 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 start menu. Click run and put in cmd.exe. What I want you to do now with this DOS prompt. Keep going, keep going, keep going. It's going to die, then it's going to come back to life. <laughs> keep going. Uh, uh, on that note, let's take some questions. We've got microphones. Because I don't know what to do at this point. We've got, um, we're we're going to pass around some mics, and we're going to start right over here. 
Right here. See, she's smart. She just stands up. Yeah. She's like, I will claim. I am Spartacus. I am. Okay. I am. <laughs> um, so I'm currently a, an acting major right now at a school in North Carolina. Um, and uh, I was just wondering, since you went to Brown, I hear a lot from actors saying, like, you know, I didn't need college. I didn't think it was important enough before I started. Uh, where do you think you would be now if you didn't go? And, like, how did it change you? Um, I would be nowhere without it because, uh, <laughs> truthfully, I needed to become a fully formed adult. So college, uh, <laughs> no, truthfully, I mean, I, I went to a school that certainly was way out of my league, and I was every single day learning from every person around me who was smarter than me. So by the end of it, I think that it was one of those things where I felt like I didn't deserve to get in, but I deserved to, to graduate um, <laughs> because I felt like I had taken everything I could from the people around me. So. Had I not had that, I certainly wouldn't have understood not only what to do, but what I liked and what I wanted to commit myself to. So there's a reason why you watch those movies over and over. And there's a reason why you go see Hamilton six times if you have $8 million. And, there's a <laughs> <laughs> and those are the, the reason why is because it's connecting to the thing that got you involved in the first place. So, so keep doing that. Keep talking to the friends all around you that inspire you because those groups of people are actually what's going to bring you to the next place, not the fame itself, I promise. Yeah. And that was not and your path. Though, yeah, right? I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll offer not a, not a contrarian, just another, not a contrarian idea, just another venue. Because I also think that, like, there's no set path. Like, your end result of whatever it wants to be, there's no math equation to get you there. Like, uh, I did go to a couple years of Lake Theater School, and... I dropped out only because I, I saw people that were doing comedy, and I, I wanted to do comedy, but like I came from a small town, and the guidance counselor was like, "Well, I guess you gotta go to university, eh?" Because like I'm from, you know, Canada, so they say, "Hey," at the end. <laughs> and so I was like, "Okay." So in, in my mind, I was like, "I want to be like kids and all. I have to go to theater school." But that's not true. Like I could have just done that the whole time, and then. That wasn't enough for me, so I like thought I moved to Chicago and thought I'd be on like Second City main stage in a year and like SNL in like a year and a half. <laughs> you know, that's also that youthful confidence that like I'm invulnerable and like the, why is the world not giving me what I want? What's wrong with them? <laughs> and then that view shifts quickly when uh, you realize how hard it is. But my point is uh, just going after what you feel is next, which brings you to the next thing and like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And I have a seizure, and I suddenly start telling the future. <laughs> the earthquake is coming 2018, August 4th. Uh, no, but like I always think of, this is gonna be a really weird uh, metaphor, but uh, I like it. I think, I think, think of yourself as an octopus. <laughs> And if you don't, and even if you are in college, like in a very set reg regimented, you know, program, think of yourself as if you don't have like all eight tentacles out, like waiting to like suck on something that like <laughs> takes you down the current. You're not using all of your abilities, and that means like generating content with your friends. Like just because you're taking classes doesn't mean that you and your friends can't go put together a live show, put together something on the internet, whatever, so that people one day might notice you and put you in their stuff. That was a good metaphor. <laughs> also, fuck college, bro. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna regret it, man. You're gonna regret it when you're like hundred thousand dollars in debt. All right, see ya. <laughs> see a question in the back. Oh, thank you. Get the Please. mic over there. Ooh. Uh, in the back, standing up there. <laughs> Joint question. Yeah. Exciting. Like now. Hi, um, so we're both like emerging filmmakers and are gonna ask the cliche question of what's your advice of like breaking into the field? Um, yeah, especially for just like comedy and um, John, I know you do a lot of adaptation and stuff like that. So what, what advice would you give for just people who like, you know, don't really have a ton of connections and are coming from, you know, not LA or New York trying to get into the scene? In my opinion, this is the absolute best time to be doing that because, again, like I said, it's based on merit. So if you do something that you believe in and it's good, people will see it or the people that you, maybe nobody sees it except that one person who's like, oh, I saw that thing two years ago. Like, for instance, I got the pilot of The Office and I took every dollar that I had for the pilot to buy brief interviews with Hideous Men, this, this movie I directed. And I remember that because the agent said, how much money do you have? And I was like, I just got a paycheck. I'll tell you exactly how much I have. And that's not to say like, oh, look at me doing what I want to do. It's 
I believed that much in it. So don't do things that you think people are going to want to see. Do things that are all you, that nobody else has. It's like, I'm sure you've seen the District 9 video that, um, that Neil showed Peter Jackson that got the movie made. It's like, what? Nobody would have ever done that except him. So you believe in something, you chase it down, you make sure it's good. Don't just throw things out there. That's what a lot of people are doing nowadays. Just like, I think that's pretty good. Like really believe in it so that when people ask you or actually people tell you, I don't like it, it's not good, or I do like it, you can stand by it and say, this is mine. And I'm telling you, that's the stuff that will start moving things forward. And not only you know, are people going to either see it or not, but you're also going to start developing like, oh, I know what I could have done differently and I know what I could do better. And now I want to do some weird nonfiction drama that has nothing to do with comedy. Just keep pushing the, the boundaries of it. Yeah. And, and I would also s say, like, fuck college. And like, <laughs> uh, no, I would say, on top of my amazing octopus metaphor, <laughs> I would say start attainable. It's really, it's really discouraging to be like, I want to be a filmmaker. How the hell am I, you know, young and no money, going to make an hour and a half movie? Uh, don't do it. I got here by doing live shows and like two minute internet shorts at like 3 a.m. with my friends. You know, like do attainable, small steps. You know, this sounds very Tony Robbins, but like this is your goal. If you just write that down, that seems impossible. You write the thing that you can do today, or the, write the thing that you can do tomorrow, and then go do it. Like, don't be like, I gotta email someone, I gotta e I'll email but right now. And small, attainable steps, you will get to where you wanna go. Do a question over here, right here on the, the end. Email them, like, do and also be like so talented and like handsome, and like, <laughs> the world will come to you. Hi. Um, I have a question more directed towards John, but Fuck if it, man. Who cares, man? <laughs> 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 All right. But I would really be open to your opinion. I don't well. care. <laughs> he's gonna. <laughs> he's gonna give it to you anyway. Uh, yeah. so. Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> this well, time it's like a squid, and <laughs> <laughs> and just ink everybody. <laughs> Ew. Um, <laughs> uh, I did a master's at a school that really promotes like succeeding off of failure. And John, you had like a lot of different avenues where you've become really successful in like lip sync battle that helped to get you where you are because this is not stuff that's in media. Um, wow, that's a good question. Um, I think that there is a conflict and all this stuff in the media industry. So I wanted to know like, what did you fail in in the industry? It's like I was saying, you just gotta believe in it. You gotta believe in something as good as lip sync battle. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no, but there's an idea that you just, we just took an idea that we thought was really funny and we thought we could do something with it and you just get it on The Tonight Show and then you make a show out of it. And that intermediary step is so easy to get. Just give me a call, call Jimmy and we'll get it on. Um, no, but I think that the different avenues is something that to be really honest, it's scary every single day. So directing this movie, bringing it to Sundance, having people judge you, it's, it sucks. It's really hard, it's really vulnerable. I'm gonna be really honest, it's tough. But that is this much of the process because the rest of it is you're on set and you're getting scared with friends. You get to meet Charlie Day, stuff like that. It's like really cool. And so you, you gotta remember that this process is being with those group of friends or being with that group of people that you believe in something. And it could be like he's saying, just do stuff that you believe that you can attain. That's such a smart idea. and. and the octopus thing I don't totally agree with. I don't know if I, I don't know if I understand it, but the um... tentacles, bro. You want eight tentacles out. If you only have seven out, you're not being a full octopus. It's super easy to understand. Um, but the the truth is, did I did I ever think I'd be doing? Uh, so I started a production company, which I was really happy to do. Had no idea what that meant. I remember an executive was like, ah, putting out a shingle, right? And I was like. Like what, I have a shingle? Um, and, and what you do is you just, you, you just love it, you know? And then the other thing that's really fun is you get to meet other people who are doing really cool stuff. So when someone like him comes up to you and says, I have an idea, that is super fun. And you start talking about how to do it. So it's, in this moment, I think it's the easiest thing to diversify because you just keep all the irons in the fire. You don't have to necessarily use them every day. You just like, my metaphor is better. And um, <laughs> it's just like someone else's metaphor, that's all. <laughs> Like Hemingway or something? <laughs> yeah, probably Hemingway. <laughs> I didn't answer it, but he's really funny. No. Uh, I actually didn't understand the question, so I won't answer it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just get a new one. Um, let's see. Let's go right here. This is pretty cool. Um, 
So you, you, you act, you direct, you write, produce. Uh, I'm just, uh, what, what's your favorite part of the creative process and why? Wow, that's a really good question. I think my favorite part of the process is I have an amazing team of people who work with me. And I think the best part of the process is walking in that room and hearing what they think is exciting and then talking about what you think is exciting. And you know, I learned it in the office writer's room, actually. I remember watching that writer's room is, was the best lesson I ever learned in my life, which is if you think of an idea almost as like a, like a ping pong ball or something that you throw up, that it's just like you, you keep it up and you keep it up and you just keep being positive to the idea until it proves that, that it's not good or not right. But you give it that time and you say like, maybe it could work like this. And I know act three is terrible and what, that guy's the bad guy? That doesn't make any sense. Try this, try that. And then at the end of the day, you're like, ah, it won't work because they did it in time cop. And then, um, <laughs> and then you, you just put that one away. But that's the most fun is always look for a way. I mean, I think if you get, get an idea or something I think the hardest thing to do, you know, uh, Bryce said it yesterday, is Bryce Dallas Howard said something really smart that I'm gonna actually live by, which is writing is hard for everybody. So just do it. Like, don't say like, oh, well, Kenny Lonergan's such a good writer. It's like, yeah, he is, but you could be. Just like, try it out. And just keep going with it until, you know, the idea either says like, oh, this is what I wanna dedicate the next six weeks to, or, oh man, I don't have time for this. It's not really clicking with me. Like, that's the most fun is seeing if it's, it's, if it's worth it or not. College helps. And maybe, huh? College helps. College, college helps? College little, helps? No, it doesn't. A little bit. <laughs> uh, being in the real world helps, son. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, that, that's, that, that's, all, that's all premium. That's all premium shit. Yeah, to, to the writing thing, like, and to any of that stuff, like, uh, your first time out is probably not gonna be very good. My first time doing stand-up sucked. You know, my first script I ever wrote sucked. But like, if you just get discouraged or if someone's like, this isn't very good, and you're like, screw it then, I'm not gonna do it anymore. Uh, you may, that's not the moxie, I hate to sound so sh old school showbiz, but that's not the moxie that Hollywood's built on. Like, it's like, you gotta have, you kinda gotta be a motherfucker about it and be like, okay, I'm gonna try again, thank you for your notes, I'm gonna make this better. Uh, and, and that's easier said than done, I'm av I get, I feel like even even still now, perpetually crushed by like someone's critique or, or if things don't pan out. I mean, but it's important to know that's going to happen, right? Yeah, so yeah, exactly. so the moment you write something, you can write the best script ever, and people will be like, have a hundred notes. Mm -hmm. You're going to write something that's not very great, and somebody might tell you it's perfect. Go make it. It's like you got to have your own barometer. You got to have your own people that you trust. Yeah. And most importantly, if you are writing for like if you know. I, this is a crazy story, but it's totally true. I used to watch Inside the Actor Studio all the time, and you know in 30 seconds if that person's worth listening to. Because if they say, like, where are you from? And they're like, Mobile, Alabama. You're like, oh, this is a performance. But if someone's like, Mobile, Alabama, this is where I grew up, you're like, oh, this is genuine. And I remember, um, uh, um, who was it? Uh, Ed Harris said that when he, somebody asked him in the, in the audience if he liked auditioning, and he was like, I love it now, but I'm also fully successful. I love doing big movies. I get asked to do big movies. If you ask me in New York if I loved acting, I hated it. It was the most terrifying thing. Yeah. And the only thing you don't get to do as an actor, a working actor, is act. So take your audition as a three minute play. Just do the three minute play. And I was like, Boosh. and I yeah. swear to God, I booked my first job the next day. So it's the same thing of writing, like write your thing, do your thing, create your thing. And the moment you say like, if I, if I make this, this will pay my rent, or if I make this, a studio will make oh, it, or this is so similar to, that thing, so if they like horrible bosses, they're gonna love this, it's total bullshit. Cause then, you know, movies like Kick-Ass would never have come out. You know, if you, if you try to do things that people are gonna succeed, then first of all, our business would be terrible because no good movies would come out. So just keep, you know, breaking the boundaries. Yeah, great. Do a question from this side, right here. Yep, you. <laughs> Thanks for calling on me. Um, I'm also a film student in North Carolina uh, with a directing focus. Um, but so fuck college, you know. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. You um, guys are all wasting your time. I can't express this <laughs> enough. I guess, I guess, no, you are right. When you do get to Hollywood, um, the president of showbiz is going to look at your resume <laughs> and say, oh, okay, cool. You've got to, I'm going to get too mean and I'm backing away. <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By all means, enjoy your time. Um, but I have a directing focus, and so on a, on a director's standpoint, is there uh, something that you have learned now or something that you experienced learning from other directors and with your experiences that you wish you had known uh, when you were first starting out? 
Uh, absolutely. Number one rule, be collaborative. The number one idea should end up on screen, whether it's yours or mine or that person's or that fake deer. Whoever says it, <laughs> no matter if it's good or bad, can't have an ego. It's where everybody, once you get that crew and you get that cast, we're all in the same boat and we're all trying to make something good. So those are the things that when those sparks hit some, you know, gas or grease or oil or whatever, they're going to be huge. So just follow that and go with it. it it's, uh, it's too often that you do see people, you know, quelling a, a really good idea because it's, it's not theirs and that's terrible. And so I, I, will, I will say I'm lucky enough to work with such great directors. That's the number one thing I can say about all of them is the best idea always ended up on screen. You, you want to be one of these cliche actors who wants to direct? <laughs> wow! Oops. Feel the burn. Do you? Is that, uh, I mean, is it the aspiration to, to take more control? In a, in a, because it does feel like, as an actor, you often don't have control over your career. You That's why I did it. Power auditions. trip, baby. Yeah. Yeah, no. <laughs> Creatively, you want to do the things you want to do, right? I, 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 I think I want to be more. Uh, I want to do just more acting and more writing, to be honest, before I get there. But. Yeah, I mean, I'm in a position now where I'm sort of working on something that might end up happening where I wrote it, I'm going to star in it, and there is an element of, like, should I be directing this thing? But I think uh, I don't want to spend the whole time, like, learning an entirely new thing at that point. So, yes, but uh, in, in due time. But, yeah, I definitely have, I've, well, I feel like I have uh, the vision enough to be that, but I can't wait for time to prove me wrong. Yeah. Well, uh, so in, in that position, you were in that position before of acting a lot and picking up things along the way. Um, how did you go about that, making that transition? Who did you look to? The directing, you mean? Yeah. Um, to be really honest, I fell ass backwards into it. I was trying to find directors for brief interviews, um, and a lot of directors didn't see it or get it or thought it was pretty intense material, and David Foster Wallace isn't for everybody. Um, so somebody just said, why don't you direct it? Actually, I think it was Rain Wilson. We were at lunch, and he was like, why don't you just direct it? This is so stupid. And I was like, yeah, this is stupid. <laughs> and, um, and I will tell you, it's, it, I got to the end of the process, and I sat down with my DP in the editing room, and he explained all the things that could have gone wrong that somehow we were fortunate enough to not have happen, and that terrified me. And that's when you realize the talent that it takes to be a director, because you have to navigate those things every day. I'm not saying I'm an incredible director. I, I'm, I, what I'm trying to say is, and I hope everybody feels the same way, is it's a journey. If you think like, oh, I decided to be a director because it's time people hear my voice. It's like, no way. It's like, I did it because I felt the safest thing to do was just jump in the water and try to swim rather than wait and wait and wait until, I, I was willing to fail rather than, I won't direct until I can direct the perfect Stanley Kubrick movie. And the new movie is Which great. is coming next year. Next when, year. when is the new movie? The, when does Hollers premiere here at Sundance? The Hollers is uh, closing night. So uh, right. Friday night, yeah. Terrific. Um, question from this side. We'll go right there. there. And Gray. The microphone. Yeah. Or not. Hi. So, John, you mentioned that there are a finite amount of like stories that you can tell. How do you keep things fresh in storytelling? Wow. Um, good question. I think that that goes back to the sort of, you got to, be a good judge because I think your first instinct is to say this isn't fresh or it's been done before. And I remember a teacher uh, at my college <laughs> said, also a college um, student. College is great. Here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> um, a writing professor at, at, at school said, um, let me just clear the air for you right away. Everything's been done. There's not anything, any story you're going to tell that isn't a version of something else. So just great. jump Crushing in. Crushing you before you've <laughs> even started. Way to go, education. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's the thing is like, it, make it personal to you. You know what I mean? And I think that that's what's so interesting. Certainly about the haulers. Like I said, you've probably heard a story similar, probably from another Sundance movie this year or other years. It's like someone returning home. It's happened before. But Jim wrote a script that was very specific to him. It was autobiographical and it was very. Um, important for him. And so to me, that's where all the goods come because you're connecting to people on a real level rather than like, I want to tell a movie about space and people having wars, but it's not Star Wars, but it's like kind of like Star Wars. Like, don't, <laughs> don't worry about it. Just keep coming up with your own ideas. Specificity is definitely a thing. You know, you end up reading a lot of scripts and when you see things that feel like just generic, and I do think, even with a story that's been told before, you have to find a newer way or something different of, of telling, this is me flipping a page of a script. 
uh, of telling it, it's got to be from some other angle because, I mean, you will read it and you'll be like, this is that, and there's no other added spice or anything to it. It's just that. And uh, you, you get 20 pages in and you don't finish it, to be honest. Yeah, there's a reason why there are serial killer movies and then there's Seven. And Seven wasn't the first one, but to me, Seven was like mind-blowingly yeah, yeah. inspirational. And it's because someone like David Fincher is that specific, you know what I mean? And that script was that good. Yeah, it's going to um, be hard to reinvent, to invent some new genre, but it's it's also, I guess, pretty hard to like do something unique within an existing genre, but doing something unique is important, I suppose, right? Another question? Uh, I don't know if that answered anything. Okay. Doing something, <laughs> hey, middle, do something middle, unique. Middle all the way in the back. Hi. Okay, so <laughs> both Richard and Jim are just... My name's Thomas. <laughs> But, you know, like, your characters are very important. A lot of people know you and feel like they know you. Has that ever hurt you more than help you? Like, for typecasting, like, when uh, people see you, do they expect you to be Richard and Jim? Interesting. I feel you're, you're steps ahead of me on that. I'd be interested in, in hearing what you Let have Let me tell you about your future. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What do I have what, in store? Um, the Office was the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me. It gave me every single opportunity. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be at Sundance. I wouldn't be anywhere without it. I owe everything to that show. So there's never going to be a feeling that I have other than total love for someone who can see me as Jim because that is such an honor that you like allowed us to keep telling those stories and you came through you know, this whole weird story with us. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. And then you start getting to meet people where you realize why it's so cool. When you meet troops who say, like, The Office is the only thing we watch to make us feel like we were home. Mind-blowing. You know, like, my mother was really sick, and just before she died, the last time she laughed was when we were watching The Office together. Like, those will change your life. So I can't ever run away from that. But at the same time, sure. Like, I also understand that if you think that I'm just Jim, you're not going to be as likely to be like, hey, let's see you pick up a weapon in 13 hours. But <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying because... I, just like everybody else, when you get an opportunity to do something, do it to the best you can and expand as fast as you can. So do, doing things that scare you and doing things that are different is what's really important about being an artist. So I'm lucky enough to have people accept me to try these new things and be a director and a producer and do action movies and stuff like that. So I, I hope people keep giving me that opportunity because as much as I love being Jim, I, I hope I can show you some other stuff too. Yeah, yeah I've, t I've tried to form this mentality of like, eager to prove people wrong as a because it puts me less in a victim mentality of like they're only going to think of me this way so like i i i get excited at the opportunity for someone to come see a live show or see me in another role to to have or at a q and a or at a q and a to have them be like oh you're not richard and i love hearing that i'm like yeah i'm acting it's a, it's a show uh, <laughs> but it's the same thing of like i, I you know this is something i'm sort of like telling you now because it's still an evolving mentality I try to get to of like even goes into auditioning like as opposed to being nervous about the thing I'm eager to show them what uh, my, my take is it's like I you want to start enjoying being in the clutch situations where instead of like being nervous instead of passing it to take that three point shot you're like I'm going to fucking try and then, and hopefully it doesn't ding up the is that your form <laughs> <laughs> I do it uh, side pitching style. Uh, uh, even that was not an accurate sports term. <laughs> All eight legs. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. We really appreciate it. <laughs> These guys are great. Joshy, Manchester by the Sea and the Hollers. Thank you.